Hi, guys. Hi, Michael. I don't know. I have another meeting, Michael. I thank you for accepting everyone. Eh? Mm -hmm. So I think everyone is here. So maybe I could start sharing this, the screen. Yeah, we can try it. Um, it's still three minutes to start. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm not uh, allowed to share. I no? need to be. Um, uh, we have to change the permissions in the Zoom meeting so everyone can share the screen probably. Ah. So you, you have to make him co-host. You have to make him co-host. So you can do it now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, he has a shirt today. He has a shirt so he can become <laughs> co-host. <laughs> so here you can see the, the screen. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Well, we can wait until. Yeah, we wait uh, two more minutes and then we start. Yeah. Well, I want to take the opportunity to thank everyone, to thank the jury for uh, meeting, for reading the thesis. I mean, it's an incredible opportunity to have an international jury. In the, it's, it, it's one of the few things that Zoom allows us that we don't have regularly, I guess. Hey, you can try to invite us to Buenos Aires when it opens <laughs> and see if it works also <laughs> that way. Yeah, that's also true. And we can also eat meat if you come to Buenos Aires. You can have an asado. Just, just bring the fridge with some vaccines. <laughs> <laughs> that's the deal. We can exchange, <coughs> exchange meat by vaccine. Yeah. yeah it's... Uh, you are recording, right, Daniel? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So just uh, before starting, um, thanks a lot to everyone for being here, the jury. Actually, when uh, we started our institute at the university, we uh, said that we wanted to uh, fight uh, the high degree of uh, inbreeding in, uh, in our universities and uh, uh, it's uh, very nice to see that Ezekiel managed to get such a great uh, number of uh, members of the jury. And I had a chance to see Fabio again after so uh, such a long time. <laughs> and um, so the, the procedure for uh, this presentation is the following. Um, Manuel will speak for about uh, 30 minutes. Then we will have uh, questions from the members of the jury. And afterwards, the members of the jury will uh, move to another uh, room to discuss uh, the presentation and the grade for the for the thesis. Uh, I will ask everyone else uh, but Manuel to uh, mute the mics. Um, of course, the, the, the members of the jury can ask questions in the in the meantime also. And, uh, and then uh, when uh, Manuel finishes, then we will uh, move into the, the questioning part. OK, so I think it's uh, it's already 10 o'clock. So, Manuel, you can start with the presentation. Well, thank you, Daniel. Uh, as Daniel said, I'm Manuel Sueca. I'm a PhD candidate at ICAS and SAM and the Sabato Institute. And I'm here to defend my PhD thesis, which is titled in Spanish, Phenomenología en búsquedas del más física pesada y cuatro tops en LLHC. And in English, Phenomenology in four top and heavy new physics searches at the LHC. My PhD advisor is Ezequiel Álvarez. My co-advisor is Alejandro Sigman. And the idea today is to give a brief overview of my PhD thesis. We want to start by stating the motivations and goals. And then we'll talk a little bit about the work we did in the last few years in collaboration with many people. I will first start discussing a bit of uh, Monte Carlo based new physics searches, where we take a specific models and see the phenomenology of these models and how we can recast existing searches and propose new ways of testing the parameter space. Then we want to talk a little bit about unsupervised machine learning based strategies about two specific algorithms we studied. And then finally, I will give a, bit, a brief remark about how all this comes together. And I'll talk a little bit about what, what we want to do in the future. So the main idea of this thesis was to study beyond the standard model effects at the LHC. But why do we want to do that? Well, we know that the standard model is a very precise, very complete understanding of nature. 
It is infuriatingly precise, but we know it is incomplete. We know this because of experimental observations and because of theoretical problems. So we know there must be a bigger theory, a more complete theory, a new physics theory, which contains the standard model. So we want to look for what we call the beyond the standard model effects. Among the many possible observables that we, or experiments that we could use to find this beyond the standard model effects, the LHC is a very good candidate because it is a discovery machine. And hopefully if there are any TV resonances, the LHC would be able to find them. So we know we can use then the LHC as a discovery machine. The question is how do we look for beyond the standard model effects at the LHC? The first strategy, the most common one, is the one I, I call uh, Monte Carlo based. In, th in this type of searches, uh, we perform dedicated supervised searches with a specific new physics models in mind. I'm not really talking about UV complete theories, I'm talking about the relatively low scale resonance we can find, like leptoquarks, C prime bosons, spectral like quarks, etc. Once we decide the specific model we have in mind, we will have a specific phenomenology with a specific signatures and we can perform dedicated searches. These dedicated searches need to rely on a very good background estimation. And so the simulation pipeline is fundamental. This is a, a very rough sketch of the simulation pipeline, which is uh, composed of very, of very impressive tools. We can start by having by taking the standard model and the specific new physics model we are interested in, we implement them both in faint rules. And when we and then we can use a series of already standard tools which have a, a very impressive way of yielding the expected events at a given channel. We can then compare these expected events with the data we measure and we can perform some hypothesis test. Ideally, what, will, what we will want is to discard the standard model only hypothesis. This would be something like discovery, which is similar to what we did with the Higgs in which we discarded the no Higgs hypothesis. This is not uh, regrettably what happens. What happens is that usually that we discard the standard model and new physics hypothesis and we, and we can then uh, draw exclusion regions on the specific model parameter space. We can recast the specific models and we will see it in the next few slides, we, assuming that the acceptances and the efficiencies are similar between different uh, new physics models. This has been a very successful strategy. The LHC program has had impressive results at excluding uh, new physics possibilities. And so now we are looking at the, at the fact that there is no best candidate for new physics. There are a lot of possible signals. And because we have also tested to the ground the, the more common, the more vanilla uh, final states, we are now- uh, Manu, uh, can see. you listen to me? Can you wait uh, one minute? Because uh, at least one of the juries was having problems with the connection and is- ah, Okay, yeah, no, no problem. The mouse, yes. can you see the mouse properly? Yeah, some of them are having trouble to see the slides. Uh, I, I can. I'm running well, yes. I'm, I'm okay now. For me, it's now okay. Okay, ah, okay. great. Well, just, just wait for, uh, Fabio. for Fabio. If, if we have the, still have the problem, maybe we should try to turn off our cameras if it helps in any way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ah, okay. I'll, I'll keep my camera on because maybe I can gesticulate a little mm -hmm. bit sure. and yes, yes. use my Argentinian power. Yeah, I don't think it was a problem of uh, the width of the band or anything. I think it was something else. So I'm not sure that you should turn off your cameras. But it's working maybe. okay for you now, no? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe it's my plan to sabotage the connection. So I can, if you don't see the talk, <laughs> it's better than the real talk. <laughs> But I, uh, whenever you want, I can continue. Yeah, I'm just waiting for Fabio. Oh, great. The, the other side over really here.
It's weird. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we wait one more minute and uh, then we okay. continue. Fabio will show. As you can see here, I really like physics, but graphic design is not my uh, strong suit. It's a... Okay, I think we can continue, and then I will. In the meantime, I will contact uh, Fabio. Okay. If you if you want, then I can send you the the slides or something. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Well, um, as I was saying, I think uh, we now are facing the position where we have no no best candidate for new physics, and we also need to go to the more exotic final states at the LHC which have the problem that now the simulations get really expensive and get really hard to validate because we go to regions with very high jet multiplicity, uh, very, very high missing ET. And so uh, that's why there is a, a current search in semi and unsupervised strategies that can help us uh, tackle the, the problem of uh, finding beyond the standard model by reducing the reliance, the reliance on Monte Carlo. How would this uh, pipeline work ideally? Well, we start with some model hypothesis because we, we still need them. There's no way to avoid that. This model hypothesis, which would be hopefully uh, less restrictive than the, the previous uh, specific new physics search uh, selection, will dictate the data representation choice, which will include data selection, how do we write the, de the data? And then once we have the, fi the final state in the data re representation we want, we can apply an algorithm which would point towards beyond the standard model effects or discard them ideally. In reality, we need to still uh, introduce Monte Carlos into the into the pipeline, not only because we want to use Monte Carlo to design the algorithms, to validate them, to know what we want, but also in the, in the, in the implementation in the data, because usually the algorithms are better, are better helped by having a good sense of what they're looking for. This is why we talk also about semi-supervised and not only unsupervised searches at the LHC. So Monte Carlo would still be present in the in the unsuper in the machine learning based strategy. So what I want to emphasize is that these approaches are complementary. We could uh, they they are not independent and they can help each other very much. For instance, one could start with unsupervised searches to point towards interesting regions and then focus the Monte Carlo efforts in these interesting regions and perform dedicated supervised searches in these regions. <coughs> We, where we now have uh, the, 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 the help and we can know where to look. Also, we could start with supervised searches, but we could enhance them by introducing semi and unsupervised algorithms to the pipeline. And this will help us to validate the Monte Carlo simulations in the signal region and reduce the systematic errors involved and which can really hinder our ability to, to extract signal from background, if there is any. Of course, one always has to remember there is no such a thing as free lunch because this, uh, in the introduction of these algorithms is, uh, introduces a whole new set of problems that we are yet beginning to understand and it's a very interesting issue. We, could, we need to understand the systematics the, that are introduced by the model hypothesis of the given algorithms we are looking for. And so we, we don't have a magic black box that can solve the problems, but we have another tool which could help us in the problem of finding a new physics at the LHC. 
So once uh, I have stated a little bit what we want to do, let me talk about the, the work we did. Uh, first, I want to talk about the work we did in collaboration with Ezequiel Alvarez, Leandro da Roda, Aurelio Juste, and Tamara Vasquez Schroeder, where we were casted existing searches to put limits on a laptop part per production model at the LHC. We were motivated mainly by the RK anomaly, which is uh, more and more popular these days. And one of the possible explanations of this RK anomaly is an S3 laptop quark, which is an electroweak multiplet with three eigen, eigen charge states, which have charge four thirds, one third, and minus two thirds. So we, we consider a theoretical description which models this laptop quark as a composite state. And the great advantage of this theoretical description is that it gives us an ansatz for the laptop quark coupling structure where we see a clear uh, generational hierarchy where the third generation couplings are way larger than the second and first generation. And so we'll have uh, the case of the laptop quark which include only a third generation quark. So top tau, top muon, and bottom neutrino because the first generation couplings are really, really small. So what we do is we focus on one specific member of the leptoquark multiplet and we focus on its phenomenology. We want to recast existing searches to put limits on a leptoquark parameter space we because we consider uh, only per production, the relevant space can be, re can be written in terms of the branching ratios. And so we have the three I mentioned before, top tau, bottom neutrino and top muon and we consider three searches which are mostly sensitive to one of these branching ratios, but which are in reality sensitive to, uh, some of them are sensitive to, uh, to some or three of them. For instance, the top tau, top tau, top tau leptoquark direct search can be recasted and it is very sensitive to the top tau branching ratio, but it's also sensitive to the top muon branching ratio. We can also recast uh, as bottom search, which is a, a different new physics model, but in the zero neutrino mass limit, assuming uh, certain things about the acceptances and efficiencies, we can recast it and it is very sensitive to the bottom neutrino branching ratio. And finally, and this is a final state that will appear everywhere uh, or not, not everywhere, but a lot in this thesis for top will be sensitive to the generation mixing that the RKS anomalies are sensitive to mainly the large top muon branching ratio. Again, because we assume no other decay channels, these three branching ratios must sum to one. Using these three searches, we can get the kind of plots I show here. On the left-hand side plot, I show one specific mass hypothesis, 700 GeV, and we see how the three searches, which are shown here with colors, are sensitive to corners of the parameter space. Here I need only to write two branching ratios because the, th the third one is trivial to obtain from here. And in green, we show the benchmark you taking the partial compositeness uh, model to the, to, the, to the letter. We have the, the, in, the, in this model, the branching ratio to bottom neutrino is one half. And there is a very specific relation between these two branching ratios. On the right hand plot, we show how we can put limits on the leptoquark mass considering two branching ratios using the existing searches and the projection of these searches to a larger luminosity and larger center of mass energy. Again, we show the favor region with what half the branching ratio to bottom neutrino. We see how for our model, existing searches can exclude leptoquarks with masses up to the TeV, and we projected future searches to exclude leptoquark masses up to 1.2 TeV. Uh, these are very competitive limits. And we also proposed uh, another channel, which was top tau bottom neutrino, which was also searched for in the future of this paper, but now are past. And the really, uh, and it was a really, fun work because uh, we can see how different searches can probe different regions of parameter space, painting a very nice uh, picture. Next, I want to talk about the a work we did in collaboration with Ezequiel Alvarez, where we, 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 get, we got even more phenomenological. We took 
a second generation leptoquark search by CMS in which they search for leptoquarks uh, for per produce leptoquarks, this is important, in two channels, mu mu jj and mu nu jj. They, they see some discarded anomalous events and they discard them because of some theoretical assumptions. So we took this as an opportunity to see how very slight deviations from this modeling hypothesis really change the phenomenology. And so one has to be careful of what of the bias one introduces when modeling the possible new physics uh, states we could see at the LHC. The main, the main, the discarded events at the CMS search are, can, are shown here. Here we see in the x-axis, it says leptoquark mass, but it's not really a mass, it's a signal region. And we see how there is a, an excess on the observed events compared with the expected events. But this excess is discarded because, and I, I not nearly quote here, there is no corresponding excess in the other channel, which would be expected for second generation leptoquarks. And the invariant mass distribution of the final state particles are not characteristic of per production. So what we did was we consider an ansatz, we consider a very simple electroweak singlet leptoquark with an ansatz at the TV scale in which we have uh, third and second generation couplings with very large values so that single and non-resonant production are, are at least competitive and they can also be dominant compared to per production. And we see that the third generation coupling can help us as an escape valve to increase the mu nu jj cross-section in comparison to the mu mu jj cross-section. And what we saw is that using this multi-generational single and non-resonant leptoquark, we can have the relevant phenomenology that was discarded as not characteristic of, uh, of leptoquarks. We see how we are able to get in this uh, plot uh, with a uh, benchmark in which uh, Y33 is larger than Y22. We have a larger uh, new physics uh, impact on mu nu jj than in mu mu jj. Here we see the relative impact. We also show in the thesis and in the paper how we could avoid flavor constraints by introducing an additional leptoquark. Again, it was all very um, phenomenological. We weren't, we weren't interested in uh, UV completions, but in showing how with very slight modifications, we only took larger couplings we are able to get a very different and very rich phenomenology at the LHC. Finally, uh, we, I want to talk a little bit about the latest work we did with Ezequiel Alvarez, Aurelio Juste, and Tamara Vasquez Schroeder, in which we propose a separate boson as a possible explanation for multilepton and bijet anomalies, which are uh, currently sitting there at the LHC looking at us. There is a consistent pattern of anomalies in TTW on four top. For instance, in this TTH search, we see that there is a, an excess in, the, in some of the bins uh, of the observed events with respect to the expected data before rescaling with the fit. We see that this excess has high budget multiplicity and it has the very interesting feature that in it is more present in the beans with positive lepton charge than in the bin with negative total leptonic charge. So we have a very charge asymmetric excess, which is attributed to a mismodeling of TTW. And this is happening in a lot of searches where TTW is, the, is either the signal or an irreducible background. And we can see how there is an interesting pattern of a need to rescale TTW. There's also the measurement of four tops. Atlas measures a cross section, which is two times as high as the standard model value. One should keep in mind, and here are the usual caveats, that the CMS collaboration measures a smaller cross section and that all the overall anomalies are very consistent with the standard model. The most likely scenario is that there is a combination of uh, theoretical mismodeling, statistical fluctuations, and systematics, which are uh, behind these anomalies. But we, of, we of course, take the opportunity of, of these uh, measurements to see 
what kind of model can help us understand these uh, these uh, very exciting patterns. So what we saw, what we propose is to use a topophilic flavor changing neutral boson. For this kind of neutral boson, the relevant Feynman diagrams for production are the following two. We have on the on this on the left hand side a uh, charge asymmetric one because we have an uptight quark in the initial state. We have a, a T set prime in the final state, and here we have a charge symmetric one with two top quarks and the set prime. If the set prime can decay to at least one top and even two, here we have a two top and three top final state, and here we have a three and four top final state. So this will contribute both to TTW and to four top because four top searches are sensitive also to three top final states. So the, the interaction Lagrangian we consider again, very phenomenologically, we don't uh, get this Lagrangian for a more UV complete model because we are interested in playing with the model. We, we have three couplings here, two that are flavor changing and one that is flavor conserving. And we see here how if we take a clear hierarchy between the, the flavor conserving and the flavor changing couplings, we have a very charge asymmetric production and a sizable decay to two tops, even below the top, the two top quark mass benchmark, uh, the two top quark mass uh, uh, point. So we can have the, the phenomenology we want. We do this and we fit our model to the TTH Atlas search data and the four top Atlas reported events. And we have, and we do this for a, a, a lot, a five mass hypotheses and we consider GCT equal to zero and show for one specific mass hypothesis how the case where GCT is different from zero looks like. We are interested in this case because the main phenomenology we're interested in is in GUT and GTT. So in the left-hand plot, we show the, the fit only to TTH. We see the best fit point here, the one and two standard deviation regions. In green, we show the goodness of the fit. And in black, we show the ratio between the standard model and new physics events in four top to the standard model only events. We see, we see how here is the measured value. And in the right hand plot, we have the combination of these two to, get, to give the best fit point, which has a lower value of GTT because of four top. And in, uh, in, in across, we show the, the best fit point using TTH and, a mesh, and an average between the Atlas and the CMS for top measurements. We show the one and two standard deviation. We see how these two are consistent. And we also show in black dot lines, the charge imbalance ratio in the four top final state, which is introduced by our model. This is a very interesting metric that could be reported by, by the collaborations and which would ideally give us a handle on if there is any, what kind of mod of BSM can lurk in four tops. So uh, we can take the best fit point for TTH uh, data alone. And we can see here how by design, our model is able to accommodate what we had attributed to TTW. Here, for instance, this is a rescaling of TTW, which is necessary to get to this point, and we don't really get there anyway. And here we keep TTW as is, and we see how TZ prime is able to explain uh, the success without getting into trouble in the other beans. Of course, this is by design, it's not a, a miracle. So we, what we propose is, well, we know we can uh, explain consistent anomalies, how would we, look, would we look for this uh, model? And we propose to use a global search in which we define a lot of bins by the total number of the number of leptons, the number of light jets, the number of beaches, and the total leptonic charge. And we see that there are TTW-like regions, four top-like regions, and everything in between. And so we can use this as a, as a nice way to disentangle signal for background. We do this also for three, for three leptons. We have the same behavior. 
uh, TTW-like regions and four top-like regions. And what we have here is the optimistic and the realistic scenario where we can use this, uh, this uh, search to project discovery and exclusion, exclusion, exclusion potential for a given set of luminosities. We see here how there's the two sigma discovery and the, which corresponds to the signal strength of one for uh, this luminosity of 130 and 39 inverse from Tobarns. And uh, we also proposed uh, a specific observable which is able to disentangle T set prime from TTW. And it was really funny, uh, but in a really interesting to see how one can explain with two couplings a really uh, complex set of measurements. Now I want to talk a little bit about these machine learning based strategies. When, when, what I mean by machine learning is unsupervised and semi-supervised because supervised machine learning is already very present at the LHC in random forests and neural networks. For instance, here I want to talk about a work we did in collaboration with Ezequiel Alvarez and Fede Lamagna on the Demixer algorithm. The Demixer was already introduced to, L to the Atlas and CMS physics uh, for quark gluon jet tagging. And we tried to adapt it to four top uh, searches. And to do this, we, we had to study a little bit the algorithm. And we see that it, that it is a, a, an, unsu an unsupervised algorithm that extracts probability distributions from a statistical mixtures by relying on two hypotheses, mutual irreducibility and the same underlying distributions in these statistical mixtures. Of course, now that we know what are, which are the hypotheses, what we tried to do was to break them and to see what happens. And we saw that uh, breaking the, the mutual irreducibility is not a big deal, but if we break the same underlying uh, distribution hypothesis, we get a very large reconstruction error in both, uh, pro in both uh, themes, in both topics. And it, the reconstruction error is larger uh, on the rarer process. That is, if we have background and signal and the signal is rarer than the background, if the two distributions are different in each of the mixtures, then we will have a larger reconstruction error on the signal. So we try to apply this to four tops. Uh, we define two statistical mixtures using the number of widgets in the final state. And we decided to demix on the number of widgets on the final state. This is the, the mixtures and these are the, the real underlying distributions with the, the real fractions and the recovered topics and the recovered fractions. And we see that in both, uh, for both processes, the, the underlying distributions are not the same, which is really to be expected because first we have finite sampling and second, there's a slight correlation between the number of beaches and the number of lightjets. And um, so we, we expect to have a, a very a large reconstruction error. We also have the fact that there is no anchor beam for the signal. There is an anchor beam for the background. And so we observe that the background reconstruction is very good, even if they are not the same. And the signal reconstruction is not ideal. And the fractions are not really getting the, the, the real values. So here we see in, so for top six, an example, how the deviations from these two hypotheses challenge the straightforward application of the mixer. We see that using these uh, irreducibility factors, we are able to correct the fractions, but because we are not, we don't have the same underlying distributions, there is no uh, getting the topics uh, right. This is also what we show in this plot, where we show how the, the two real distributions are very far from the appropriate fractions region. And so, there is really a difficulty in implementing this algorithm like it is two four tops. Luckily, what we saw is that it's still useful because it can serve as a Monte Carlo tuner in signal region. What we can do is we take the data, we apply the mixer. From this, the mixer, we can get the topic for the background. 
and use our Monte, and tune our Monte Carlo to match this uh, appropriately extracted background and use this tune Monte Carlo to estimate what we expect the signal distributions to be. And once we have the signal distributions, we can compute the background subtracted signal distributions and compare them to the uh, extracted uh, signal topic. And we can see if, the, if there is an agreement or if there is something uh, funny uh, going on there. So lastly, I want to talk about the work we've been in collaboration with Barry Dillon, Dario Farui, and Jernay Kamenik, in which we expanded on a previous work of theirs in which they proposed a latent Dirichlet allocation as a means to model a jet substructure analysis in a generative approach and to have an event by event classifier, uh, it, which would be very helpful for new physics. So what they did, what they did is to, to, to write the jet and in the subjects present as a series of words of observations. And so we can use LDA to model the jet as a sampling of words from themes. And we are interested in recovering these themes and see what, if they can be helpful as a classifier to interpret what happens, etc. So each document, which would be an event, has its own theme fractions, which are obtained from a common prior, which is the Dirichlet prior. So we have here two Dirichlet hyperparameters, one for the topics, one for the theme fractions. And so for each event, we have the set of theme fractions we use these infractions to assign to each word a topic and to sample the word from the assigned topic using the topic uh, word probabilities. So we consider the eta parameter fixed, the hyperparameter fixed, but we, we, we see that the hyperparameter alpha, which control the team fractions, defines a landscape of LDA classifiers. And so now we have the problem of choosing the right hyperparameters. We see how choosing uh, different values for alpha, we parameterize them using sigma and rho. Uh, we have uh, themes which will be, uh, which we have documents which will have mostly one theme and there will be a, a set of documents with theme one, a set of documents with theme two. We will have a set of documents a lot of documents with theme one and not really that much documents with theme two. And here in blue, we show the case where the documents are mostly a mixture of the two, of the two themes. So before uh, exploring the, how to choose these hyperparameters, we explore the data representation and we see there is a very uh, cool in interplay between discriminatory power and co-occurrences when choosing the vocabulary. And so we consider two benchmarks with nine, with nine distributions and I show them using the two observable bases we consider. In the, right, in the left hand side, we have a top quark per production. This is the second column and QCD digests written in the mass basis. Here we have the, the mass of each splitting and the child to parent mass ratio for these splittings. We see here the top quark decaying to a W boson, the W boson decaying. And because the top quark is colored, we have QCD radiation in this, uh, in this uh, case. We see here that the two jets are very similar and that there is a very, uh, an overlapping region between QCD and TT bar. This is why we need LDA and not a, a, mo a more simple mixture model because the, the, the themes are really, sim the true distributions are really similar. There is a, a, a the, the a QCD event, uh, a QCD event is a QCD event, but a top quark event has a little bit of top quark and a lot of QCD. On the right hand side, we show a new physics benchmark, we consider a very heavy W prime, which decays to a phi, bos a phi scalar and a W boson. And this phi scalar decays to two W bosons. And we also have the same background, QCD digest. And you write this in the primary loom basis. The primary loom basis is a very useful one that has been introduced to a study just of structure. It is infrared and collinear safe. And so in this case, the two jets are very different from one another because here we have the phi scalar decaying 
to two W bosons and the W boson decay. And here we have only the W boson decay. We see again that there is QCD in the signal topic. There is not really that much because here we have a, a colorless uh, beyond the standard model resonance and because it, it, they are both very heavy. So what we did is we show how to, the perplexity can be used as an unsupervised metric that is correlated with the tagging performance. And so it can be used to choose the suitable hyperparameters without really looking under the hood with, to label data. And so we can select the topics and see, and, and, and see the topics that best classify the, the data for the benchmarks we consider. And here are the recovered topics, top quark per production, W prime production. And we see how LDA recovers the archetypes of the signal. We don't get the QCD behavior. The QCD is assigned here. We have the top quark, uh, the more top quark like features, the hard features, the same is for W prime. And we get rid of the, of the QCD like behavior, which is assigned to the background topic. So the main conclusions we have from this work was that this unsupervised technique could, be, could point towards beyond the standard model effects, assuming only certain features. In this case, mainly that the, the jet substructure is an adequate observable basis that can combine discriminating power with co-occurrences in, in an efficient way. And we, and we showed how the perplexity can be an adequate metric, which is correlated with supervised accuracy metrics, and so can be used as a, an unsupervised uh, tool for selecting the appropriate L L LDA hyperparameters. We also explore other hyperparameters and their impact on performance. And we show how it is at least it is a very interesting tool that could be helpful in an exper experimentalist toolbox. So let me give a brief uh, conclusion. During the last three years, I have, I've been very lucky because I had the opportunity to, co to collaborate with a lot of people and to learn about several beyond the standard model models with their specific phenomenology and signatures, and also to learn uh, about machine learning based approaches to searching for rare signals at the LHC and how uh, and, and the limitations and, and advantages of these two approaches. And I'm more lucky yet because there is much to be done. We are still beginning to learn from beyond the standard model hunting and how it can help us to build the appropriate machine learning algorithms and to see how these two strategies can, uh, can play together and enhance our sensitivity to beyond the standard model physics even more. Uh, last, uh, and coming soon, what we want to do in the future and are, are already starting to do now, we are very interested in improving on LDA. Uh, Dario here will not let me lie. Uh, we are interested in incorporating priors and use a semi-supervised analysis to improve the power of LDA and also to consider other algorithms such as hierarchical Dirichlet processes and dynamical topic models. And also we are interested in the specific problem of applying machine learning algorithms to the four top final states. We want to use this, uh, what we are learning to, to find the relevant features in four top classification, explore the feature space with variational autoencoders. And we are also using a simple custom made graphical model, uh, much like LDA. This is a model where the conditional relations between uh, observ observables and random and the parameters can be written in a, with a graph to use to, Monte to, to tune our Monte Carlo in the signal region and get a better performance on the supervised searches. So let me take the opportunity to thank everyone here. First and foremost, I want to thank Ezequiel Alvarez, who has, uh, who has been able to stand me for the last four years, because he also, stand, uh, he also had to put up with me during my master thesis. I also want to thank Alejandro Sigman, who has done the same, even if he, if he was able to escape a little bit more being in La Plata. I want to thank the, the members of the jury for taking the time and the interest in this thesis. I want to thank everyone at ICAS and at the Sabato Institute uh, for everything. 
I want to thank uh, my family. I want to thank my friends. I want to thank Luli. And I think I don't have anything else to say. So I would appreciate any questions you might have. OK, Manu, many thanks for the presentation of your work. So I propose that we move into the questions of the jury, and then we can uh, applaud, congratulate him, and so on. OK? So who uh, wants to start with the questions? Okay, I can ask a question. Yep. Um, so uh, when a particle physics says PSM, a cosmology thinks dark matter, right? So let me ask some, some questions that might be connected with dark matter or not. Um, so your leptoquark states, they are unstable, that, and you, you, you study all these possible channels and so on. But is there a possibility that a leptoquark state may be stable or has a light, long life? You mean like a, a leptoquark that is, um, the thing with leptoquarks is that they are colored. So I don't know if you could have a, a color leptoquark roaming free in space like the dark matter. Yeah. Right. Okay. You would have to have bound states then I don't know, but maybe they are too heavy. I don't know about that. We will have to have a, call a bound a states made from leptoquarks because of QCD. So they will be not very straightforward. They apply to dark matter like a colorless scalar would. Right, okay, thanks. And so regarding your Z prime, so this Z prime uh, is motivated by these B-jet anomalies and these uh, multi-lepton discrepancies. Um, so in, in the WIMP searches, uh, so looking for weakly attractive massive particles, having the, the standard Z as a mediator is almost ruled out by data. It's a bit controversial but on dark matter searches. But some people consider that you may have a Z prime uh, as a mediator for the dark matter. Uh, does does your, your constraints on, on your Z prime have any, um, do you know if they have, may have any implication on this possible Z prime as a WIMP mediator? I don't know because because of our specific model and we wanted to avoid a lot of experimental constraints on the C prime, it avoids couplings to up, up quarks, to up charm quarks. And so we only have a top quark uh, state in the decays. So it would be very, I think it's difficult to use this as a mediator for WIMP because uh, we would have to have always a top quark in some part of the Feynman diagram. But I don't, I, I really didn't think about it, but probably, I, I don't know about the masses also. Do you have to have a very light mediator or a heavy mediator is okay for WIMPs right now? Um, I think right now it's quite open. You could have heavy mediators, yeah. Well, maybe if you introduce, here we don't have couplings neither to leptons, neither to same sign, same, generation light quarks. Maybe if you introduce those, you can have a mediator for WIMP, but then you can run into limits on the on the lepto, on the direct searches for set prime at the LHC, which would be the main problem there. Right. Thanks. No, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Hey, I guess I, I can ask a question. Okay. Yeah, so in one of your works, uh, you give up on CKM unitarity, or you had the possibility <laughs> one of the models of not having CKM unitarity. So two related questions. The first is, if you just add leptoquarks to the standard model, will CKM unitarity be, will be violated or not? If I add leptoquarks to the standard model. Yeah. Yeah. So your model is one of your models, which is, let's say, uh, yeah, standard model plus S, one of these S third or... Yeah. I don't see why uh, CKM unitarity could be, would be violated by introducing leptoquarks, but I, I didn't see it at least. Uh, we, when you say that we gave up on unitarity is because in one of the works we put limits using a value of, the, of a CKM matrix element that does not respect unitarity bounds. Right, you use VTS, you use also bounds that are from direct measurement that do not assume CKM unitarity. Yeah, we didn't do it because we believe that the leptoquark violated unitarity, but because 
we wanted to cover all bases when using experimental values to constrain our model. Uh, but I, I don't think that adding a leptoquark would violate unitarity. So what uh, does it take? So the second question is, what would it take? What do you have to do to the standard model if you want PK and unitarity to be violated? Have to do to stand up. well. Uh, I have to think about it because sorry, it's a very nice question. To violate unitarity, well, one would have to introduce uh, couplings, which are not. Uh, which are flavor changing and also which are not uh, Hermitian, right? Or something like that to introduce a coupling that is not. But in fact, you have to, to introduce additional particles to the standard model or additional fields. Uh, can you tell? Yeah, but well, which what kind of particles would yeah, I have to that, introduce? That, like, a, for instance, if I introduce a, a heavy fermion, and we have a mixing and another generation, like what would, would have happened if we added the sterile neutrinos to the lepton sector and we would have PMNS unitarity violation. You're talking about something like adding more yes. quarks. It, exactly. I mean, ah, okay, if you yeah. see of, yeah, that, that's the answer. You should add quarks either in the fourth generation or vector like. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. If you add uh, another generation of vector like quarks, yeah, you have unitarity violation because you are considering three a matrix of three by three, but you have really a matrix of more of more dimensions. Right. Yeah. And, okay, one more question. So the B anomalies serve as a motivation for you uh, to add leptoquark or to... Uh, the B anomalies suggest an upper bound on the scale of uh, new physics, right? Both R sub K and R sub D. Do you know what these upper bounds are? And what they tell us if we are guaranteed, if these are real anomalies explained by new physics, should we expect to be able to see them in the LHC or not on this upper bound on the scale? I think, yeah, the, the upper bounds are uh, not TV, but not really that much above TV, like 40 TV, something like that. Is there I, I a difference think. between the upper bound coming from R sub D and the one coming from R sub K, or if you know, if you happen to know? Uh, no, not really. I don't have really the difference in the scale coming from R, R sub D and R sub K in the top of my hand. I'm sorry. Okay. Maybe, yeah, no. I, I, I could make up something, but it probably would be wrong. Oh, so, okay, so maybe on a qualitative level, the R sub D is related to three, to let's say correction of order 15% to a three level standard model yeah. process. And R sub K is about 15% or so correction to a loop level standard model process. So yes. can, you, can you intuitively say which one allows physics at higher scale than the other? Well, intuitively I would say that the loop scale would be more sensitive to, because the, the one that is suppressed at three level uh, needs a, a smaller contribution from the new physics so we can have a higher mass for this BSM model. When we right. have a three level effect, we need a very high three level, uh, we need a very high new physics contribution. So we need a lower scale. That would be my reasoning at least. That's correct. It's a correct reasoning. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Maybe I can also <clears throat> just yeah. uh, in. Um, so at the same place, essentially regarding flavor observables, um, you are tensioning here um, physics models from different angles, right? So essentially from low energy observables and from relatively high energy observables at hadron colliders. And then you are trying, you're comparing essentially the couplings of this model with observables at low and at high energy, do you have to do something to connect them, or how did you go about it? Yeah, ideally, we, if one do it properly, we would have to use the renormalization group equations to relate the scales. But what we saw when we tried to relate these models was that 
the relation, the relation these equations uh, don't really change that much because of the operators we consider because they are nearly diagonal in the in the renormalization group equation basis. So if we started from a TV, not a really high scale, but a low scale, a TV scale, we didn't have to change that much when going for between flavor and uh, and the LHC. A, a more precise study would have to take them into account, of course. Uh, we were mainly interested in having the a sense of how flavor plays into LHC, into Atlas and CMS. Yeah. But yeah, it's um, it's not that they are not important, it's that they are subleading. Okay, yeah, sure. As long as you're aware of it, and you, of course, you could always supplement your existing analysis with an RGE improved um, calculation. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, we look at the renormalization group equations mainly for the, the single and non resonant leptoquark paper where, where we were most interested in flavor. And when we saw them, we figured that we could still use uh, the ANSATs in that way without uh, uh, taking into account the effects, but knowing that they existed. Yeah, we will have to do it more precisely. I have a couple of questions to the machine learning part as well. Um, yeah, of course. So the um, uh, demixer procedure, I was wondering if you tested how well it generalizes. I mean, it's an, uh, essentially an unsupervised or yeah, less supervised uh, uh, approach. What? We generalize this to more topics or to more? Yeah, exactly, to more topics. Yeah. yeah, we didn't test it. I think there, there, there is a work by uh, Jesse Taller and collaborators in the LHCO uh, paper, which aims at generalizing this. Uh, we, were met, we, didn't, we, we thought about doing it, it, but it is hard work and we wanted to go to the event by event classifiers because the, 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 the mixer is not really an event by event classifier. So LDA is for instance, and the one I mentioned in the spoiler section that we want to start implementing also, it's a bit like the, the mixer because it's a, a mix of uh, of distributions, but we want to implement it as an event by event. And then we can generalize it more easily because we don't need the anchor beans. We can perform Bayesianal inference and, and, and use uh, Bayesian methods to extract them without needing anchor beans for every single topic in, and defining yeah. the statistical mixtures. And exactly, yeah, right. And for the LDA, um, you were rather brief on the description, but of course it's in your thesis. I mean, how do you train it? What's actually learned in the LDA approach? I mean, where's the learning part of the machine learning procedure? In the variational inference uh, app. Uh, okay, well, we start with, we have our documents in the appropriate representation. We initialize uh, our, our uh, we, we set our hyperparameters, which are both the, the algorithm, the model like alpha and eta, and then the hyperparameters for the, for the variational inference procedure. And then we do approximate inference using this variational inference where we learn, we update sequentially the approximation we used for the posterior. That is, we have the, the analytical expression for the exact posterior of LDA of the, the posterior over the, the, thopi, the themes, the theme fractions and the theme assignments, but we don't really, we are not really able to get them using uh, integration, we have to do an approximation. We could use a numerical Bayesian inference like a Gibbs sampling, but we use a variational inference where we approximate the posterior by a product of a pro of a functions Q, which are uh, which have their own parameters. Those are, I think, lambda, uh, gamma, and I don't remember the other phi. I think, and this parameters which are designed to approximate the hyperparameters of, a, of the posterior are updated sequentially by going through the corpus and looking at the core occurrences mainly. That's what really happens. In each state, you count, you, you first need to compute the responsibilities, then you use the, responsa the responsibilities to update the assignments to each theme and the assignments from each team to each word, and then you update 
these assignments into your functions and you have an approximate expression for the posterior. You run it several times until you are trusting you have converged to a good approximation of your posterior. I don't know if I made too much sense there. I'm sorry if I got. So from a practical point of view, I see essentially two challenges um, if I wanted to apply this to a more uh, complicated case, namely the increase of feature space. I mean, having more features at the moment, you are only using uh, the number of light projects. Um, and on the other hand, um, um, deciding on the prior, so I mean, deciding on the Dirichlet um, function that you would essentially put in, right? So this is not so clear how you would do that in a relatively unsupervised uh, way. The, 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 the first problem is really a problem because the, you need a rich feature space because you need a discriminatory variable. But if you have a too rich uh, feature space, maybe you risk that LDA does not find anything. And that is a problem that right now I don't think we are ready to say we, are solved, we have solved it. We need to explore a bit more. Maybe that's, there, there's also the problem of how to, to incorporate the interplay between global and local variables. Here, for instance, we see only jets of structure. We don't see the, the how do you call it? The tau 31 over tau 32. The, the, yeah, I don't remember the end subjectiveness. We don't incorporate the end subjectiveness and we don't incorporate the number of jets. It learns it because of the labels, but we are not really telling it the number of B jets if we had to look into some other case. So that's another problem, which is interesting. And the second one, which was how to use the hyperparameters. Well, what we started exploring in, in, the, in the thesis, what we showed was that we kept a flat prior essentially on the themes. So we were agnostic and then we perform an, an, an hyperparameter scan on alpha. But we could start from other uh, theme distributions, we could maybe, if you're looking for very rare signals, set one of the topics to the data and the other to be in flat. And, the, and uh, another possibility is to use Monte Carlo to set uh, the appropriate topics. That's something we are looking into right now. But I think if I had to give a, an opinion of how to tackle the first one, and maybe also the second one, is what we are beginning to do is to make our own models which uh, are own graphical models, which take more easily into account what we expect the LHC data to be. Here, here we are adapting foreign code to, a, to an LHC problem, which is great because we are learning a lot, but we, we, we want to get to the point of where we are able to write our own models for our own problems, which are LHC specific uh, data. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, hi, it's Peter speaking. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, thanks a lot for your presentation and thanks a lot for uh, your uh, work and write up, uh, which I enjoyed uh, very much. And there was a, a, in several instances a source of uh, real, uh, you know, a lot of inspiration and curiosity to go. A bit uh, beyond also what uh, people are doing uh, currently, both uh, model building and um, in the analysis. So thanks a lot. Um, I have a, I have a just very simple couple of questions. So the first one is a curiosity about this Z prime model um, uh, with the CNC. I was wondering, uh, you know, naively, I was also expecting, but maybe you mentioned it at some point that you would get. Uh, same sign tops, no, from, from this. And this would be uh, in itself uh, charge asymmetric also. Um, is this uh, somewhat included in your analysis or was already used for set bounds or? We, we consider same time, same sign top production. We saw that it was subleading for the signatures we were interested in that is, with a, another jet, an extra jet, at least uh, being produced. Because in our case, we have same sign top with a, jet, with a jet that is hard because it decays from the seed prime. But we also have 
same side, same sign top per production. We have two up quarks in the initial state, two tops, and there is a jet that is radiated from one of these, uh, from, from maybe you have a gluon and you have one of the ups and another one that is radiated from initial state. And this was very subleading compared to the hard process. So for the signal, we, we didn't consider it in the final analysis. We saw that it was subleading, but we consider same sign only for the limits on the search on their model. And what we saw was that the, the, they are the closest, the closest ones to constraining our model, but they are still not uh, getting to the point where we had to take them into account to the, for, because of the smallness of our GUT coupling. Because it's so small, same sign top uh, is not really finding it. Also, it decays a lot with the mass of the set prime. So we, we consider it only as a, as a constraint on our model because it is subleading for the signal we are interested in. In the sense that we have two cap, I mean, it's uh, an, at the amplitude level, it's already squared in the FCNC coupling. That's the reason why it, it's small. It's, it's not only because of the couplings, because we also have uh, uh, a lot of couplings in the other diagrams, but also because of the mass and the width of the set prime, because it's relatively, uh, because it's relatively narrow, the width, we take very small couplings. There is not really that much room for a T-channel process to be so important. That's also something that's... We, uh, so, well, the, the, the winds didn't, didn't matter in the, in the T channel. Uh, but scattered. we need to have the T channel as a way to have non resonant production, right? A width, at least. If you don't have, if you're not able to do it, then how would you? Uh, no, to no, have no, yeah. a very large production, I mean, compared to an S channel one. We have an S channel, you have the, the set prime. Let me give a little bit, sorry, here, because I'm not the... So here we have the set prime, which is produced with only one coupling. Mm -hmm. So it is less bleeding in that sense, but also it's in the in a less channel and it's produced resonantly. If we go to the non-resonant case, you have this as in the T channel, you have two couplings and you need also a radiated jet to count for the signal region. So it's suppressed. No, no, but in, your, in your signal region, yes, but in the, ah, same, in the, in the same sign top search, uh, you, you, I mean, you no, can stray. It's not that small. It's really close. I think it was like the limit was uh, not really that much above the, 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 our, our cross section, at least for lower masses. But when you have higher masses, the cross section really diminishes. And so the limits were really loose. Also, the, the searches are really optimized for high mass, uh, for TV scale set prime. They okay. look for, they have a very large HT cut, which we don't, uh, we don't have large HT with a, with a light set prime. So regarding to, to this, I mean, I, I, I was a bit intrigued by this story of the charge uh, asymmetry, no? I mean, to this charge uh, dependence. Um, and uh, uh, so, because some of the background are charge asymmetric at the end, no, like uh, 50 bar W. Yes. Uh, so, so it's not that by itself, uh, um, my definition is going to help, no? I mean, they, they think no, yeah, but I mean, some of the backgrounds are anyway. So did, did, you, did you prove this, this you, uh, issue? I mean- In, in for top, you mean like as a, as a handle or in, in general? Well, in for top, it says, I mean, the standard model is symmetric and uh, your your new physics is non-asymmetric, right? In principle, but then, but I was saying that some of the backgrounds anyway in the solar model are asymmetric. Ah, yes. yes. So, so at the end, uh, your final data sample, which will have some backgrounds, will be asymmetric. 
So you compare with that? I mean, you compare with the backgrounds which are asymmetric also? Yes, in the, in, in the global search we did. Okay. But mm -hmm. the, the thing is that we are charged asymmetric like TTW, but we also charge asymmetric in places where TTW doesn't count. That's the, 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 the main idea from the global search, that you have charge asymmetry, which you could assign to TTW, but you have more, uh, more, uh, more regions where this charge asymmetry is also present. That's also, but the, the, the thing is that if, if you couldn't blame TTW, you, would have, uh, uh, you wouldn't have the problem of finding your physics because it would be there. That's why they are assigning it everything to TTW. Mm -hmm. So that's why also we introduce the additional variable that max mean, because in the in the region where we have TTW, T set prime and TTW are very similar by design. So you need mm -hmm. to introduce additional variables that take into account the difference, which is in, in this case that the tops come the, the the leptons come from different places. So. In, in the places where TTW is relevant, charge asymmetry will not help you find T set prime because T set prime acts as a rescaler of TTW. Because that's what we wanted. But if you introduce additional variables, you can break the degeneracy of the two processes. And as you say, these additional variables will not have to do with charge asymmetry, but will have to do with uh, the process is involved. In our case, that if you have T set prime, then you will have a top and a, 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 lot, a top and a jet coming from a resonance, and then a B jet and a lepton will be very much similar than if they come from a W, which is uh, less boosted. That's all. Oh, and the other question I had is that whether you, uh, when you did the simulation, you did also, in the case where the, the Z prime coupling was uh, diagonal, right on the top, um, did you also include an interference with the standard model? No. Or... We... Okay. No, it was, uh, it's something that has to be improved, yeah. We, we... We, we, in a more complete analysis, we will have to include interferences everywhere, probably, because we are rescaling everything. Uh, we, that's why we don't really care about the sign of the couplings in the dia in the plots. If we have right, interference, right. we should right. care about the sign. Right, 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 right. Okay. Uh, okay. The thing is, we trusted. Uh, a bit naively, naively that if we have a small enough coupling, maybe the interference effect are subleading. I don't remember, maybe we try them in some moment. So, but yeah, we can see, we, because of our procedure in obtaining this, uh, these plots in an efficient manner, computing the interference the, with the standard model would be really difficult because we couldn't, we, I don't know if we could parameterize it as easily. If you remember from the thesis to do these plots, we did a parametrization of the, of the events and we, we used a fixed finite set of events to obtain, to, to obtain coefficients that can generate arbitrary couplings, arbitrary points in this space. And so we can have very, uh, very fine uh, grids. If we did interference, we'll have very coarse grid and the numerical effort would have been Larger. Yeah, 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 indeed. Yeah, that's not not very easy. Also, because there are interferences with uh, both QCD and electroweak diagrams, and uh, uh -huh. this structure is uh, possibly um, somewhat uh, complicated. I mean, it's very difficult to to decipher it uh, from the from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, it's like uh, we will have here. We use, for instance, we, you, we use uh, next to lead in order simulations of the backgrounds, and we could in QCD, but we couldn't do this if we use interference, like with an EFT. You can right. do in, uh, next to lead in order calculations, and you have to trust the lead in order ones. Right, so right. In, yeah. And okay, so just if I, this, you might also see. I don't, I don't, I don't, I didn't find it explicitly. But uh, 
this z prime that you consider are um, anomaly free or you don't worry about it or you we don't worry about it okay we i didn't verify that it was anomaly free and the, the thing is that because of the couplings maybe it could have some anomalies because we have right-handed and not left-handed couplings but i will have to check we didn't i don't have the I really answer. I really answer for that. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so well, let me ask only a very naive question on the second part, which uh, uh, for, I mean, for my expertise, it was a bit technical, of course. Uh, I mean, when you do this uh, unsupervised, when you try, right, these unsupervised methods. Uh, so what you always assume that in the end your standard model simulation uh, agrees with your standard model data. I mean, sorry, let me say it again. So you, you assume that your standard model is simulation is perfect, would be perfect, or uh, I'm not, you see what I mean? Yes, uh, we are cheating a little bit. We are saying we don't trust the Monte Carlos, so we need uh, to use uh, unsupervised methods, but we use these Monte Carlos to design the supervised methods, trusting that what works for them will work on real data. I mean, we we don't say, we say that the behavior of the algorithm on the Monte Carlo simulations we use in this work will be more or less the same when we apply it to real data without seeing Monte Carlos. In a, in a fully unsupervised uh, manner. I don't know if, if that's what you were asking, but... Well, what I'm asking is, uh, imagine a future when we really go and, and use this uh, on data, no? Um, I mean, I, I, you need some, some, some prediction for the standard model, no? Yes, I, 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 yes I agree. I think that in a realistic implementation of this, you will always need at least some background estimation to help the algorithm. That I don't, that's why we wanted, uh, I wanted to emphasize the semi-supervised part, even if we didn't really use it here, that it will be like, uh, for instance, in, the, in this type of work, instead of working with one Monte Carlo, we would work with two Monte Carlos, one which will play the part of real data and one which will play the part of the Monte Carlo we will use in a real experiment to help our algorithm work. We, we, we need to give it a head start, but uh, ideally it, it, it needs to, it will be something like in LDA, the priors, in a, in an, in a Bayesian uh, method, you would use the Monte Carlo as priors, as prior information of what you expect without really marrying, committing to the Monte Carlos. Because, the, the, because of the, you need to, to keep an, an uncertainty, which is already used in the, in the experimental searches. It's not that, it's not really that different from doing, uh, introducing these uh, Poissonian uncertainties on the Monte Carlo and, use, and introducing systematics in the, in the profile likelihood fits. It's, uh, we would use the Monte Carlos as a starting point, but maybe in a Bayesian viewpoint and using uh, this uh, unsupervised uh, uh, algorithm where we don't have to label the data when training, we can avoid certain problems. Mainly, for instance, in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, case, in the C prime boson case, for instance, the Monte Carlos are great, are state of the art. It's not a problem of them, it's the data that's really difficult. It's not a, it's not a simulation problem. It's a, it's a data problem. That's why maybe the, 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 the thing with the machine learning algorithms is not to replace, but to enhance and to use them as a starting point and be more adaptable to the data probably. I don't know if that answered the question, but... No, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm curious, right? What is a, a bit the logic, because I would have said that 
a priori that you need some kind of modeling uh, uh, of the, I mean, of the Muir Monte Carlo predictions with their own uncertainties, right? And uh, I mean, you would say that there is an anomaly when uh, even by adjusting the Monte Carlo in some with data in what you would call the control region in a normal analysis, you see that uh, um, there is still something that um, is not described correctly. No. So I, I, was, I was thinking how this kind of naive procedure that we use now would be mirrored in an unsupervised uh, uh, algorithm. Well, well, you can use the Monte Carlo as a prior and then see where the algorithm takes you and then use because you, we, you will ideally work with probability distributions, you won't need to add this. Uh, you, you can do this Bayesian analysis where you can see the, for example, the distance between your priors and your posteriors using the Kullback, Leibniz, the amount of uh, entropy. You can see the amount of information you need to add. You can see how different everything is from your Monte Carlos in a more, in some sense, consistent way, because you don't have to introduce as many, uh, how do you say, uh, um, so many arbitrary uh, choices, like the systematics or the, which is, but you, I mean, you, in the end, it, it's not, it's, an, it's another tool. It's not really, I think you won't be able to replace the knowledge of the, you need to use the knowledge of the standard model, the knowledge of the, of the LHC. That's why the simulations are very useful because they encode everything we know. We can't, uh, we need, the, we need uh, uh, the algorithm needs to encode everything we know and work from there. You won't be able to, to get anywhere if you don't start from the amount of knowledge we, we have accumulated along, I don't know how many years of collider physics. I think it, it was in this, uh, one of these uh, conferences in this pandemic year, when they say that there is no need to throw the amount of, uh, you have to take advantage of all the previous knowledge. And that's why semi and unsupervised searches are, uh, could help there. They will not replace or they will not really, uh, um, yeah, I understand what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks very much. No, thank you. Thank you for all the questions. It's really interesting to talk about these things. Okay. So, next. I, think Martin, yeah. I am next. I have yes. only a very general question. Uh, from your analysis, can you draw some definite conclusions about the existence of new physics in the, dat the data that you have looked at? It's, I oh. mean, yeah. I, I, and if not, what do you need? If I had to be realistic and cautious and everything, uh, probably, I mean, we need to find and need to dig deeper. And there, there, but there are no reasons to expect there is anything beyond the standard model. But I, I mean, everything I worked in, uh, I really like. I don't know if there is anything, but it's, for instance, I'm really. I'm really a fanatic about my work. I, I really like it. It's, it's not, I'm sorry, it's not, it's, I don't know if it's well done, but it's exciting. And I, I think that uh, it's interesting to look at it. I, I, I would not be able to say if there is anything. It's probably nothing, like I said in, the, in this one. It's probably a lot of, of pro, not a lot of problem, but it's probably, everything is probably a standard model. And you have to be very cautious and you need extraordinary evidence for an extraordinary claim like beyond the standard model physics at the LHC. So everything I did in this, uh, in this thesis is under, has to be taken under, under that, uh, under that uh, way of thinking. Everything here is chasing uh, some anomalies which are most likely, most likely standard model but we are still learning a lot from them. It's still very fun and, the, and there could be, but if I had to bet money on it, probably not that there's no really, everything is probably standard model. We need to dig deeper. 
Yeah, my, so, my question was whether you need more uh, theoretical input or more empirical input in order to rule out. Uh, no, empirical input. Huh? Right now it's an experimentalist game. The LHC is an experiment. It's, everything is exper that's, it's, uh, the experiment. The data will, will lead us to where we want to go. I mean, we need to listen to the data. They will rule out everything and then we can look in other places and see what they can tell us. Right now, I don't think there's a, the only theoretical input will be better, better variables, better understanding of the data, better, uh, better uh, methods, but it's also what they do in the collaborations. It's not really a, a, a pen and paper. Uh, I but also in your, model calculations you have may, maybe neglected some corrections or whatever yes yeah, yes uh, of course the, the models could be could be wrong and um, but the thing is that I'm not wrong every, i mean no not wrong that somehow some incomplete uh, incomplete or yeah yes mm -hmm. for instance what we did in this thesis are everything except the the, the first one that we did with Leandro uh, really dispenses with UV complete models. We only care about the low energy resonances. And this is by definition incomplete. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it could be missing something. There could be uh, a reason why the, our phenomenological resonances couldn't exist in a UV complete model, for instance, the C prime boson with this coupling structure, with these coupling values, without anything else, sorry, without anything else, maybe it's not possible. We, we, we verify that we, we, it's possible. There could be a mistake and it could be ruled out by theory, but we were more, more interested in the experimental impact. So there could be a, a UV complete theory, which is really great and which will help us look into a better channel to focus the, the efforts to lead the way and see, well, this theory says we have to look here, then we, we need to focus all efforts into looking there. This could happen. Right now, it's mostly the other way around. There is a, an impressive experimental effort. The collaborations are doing incredible work and uh, they they point towards what we are interested in that is learning from data because the standard model is really precise is really great and we are learning still how to to search to validate it and to search for it in more exotic states that's why uh, i think uh, it was in friday's daniel's talk about precision being the name of the game because right now we expect everything to be a standard model so we need to look at the standard model and we need to look better and we need to see if there is anything that is not standard model. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, so I think we finish here with the question by the jury. First of all, I would like to thank all the members of the jury for the interesting questions. Actually, I found many of them more interesting than somehow ones we find in the many uh, online works we participate uh, every day. So it was uh, very nice. Second, uh, just a few words about Manu. I'm very happy that he's a member of our institute. He's a very nice, collaborative, smart guy, doing things with the same passion. He was defending his, uh, his work. So it's always more than welcome to have somebody like him. And uh, I think I will invite everyone now to unmute. Uh, uh, you can open your cameras and then we can uh, give him a uh, very cold yet because we are all uh, away, but uh, try to be a warm applause and uh, congratulations for the work. Hello, Manu. Hello. Cold and cautious because we still need the jury to say. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <Yeah. laughs> all for the least, warm because. Uh... Okay, so uh, bravo, Manu. And then the shooting will uh, move into another uh, room in a Google Meet. They already have the connection, I guess. Otherwise, if you don't have it, just uh, let me know and I will send it. I will. I don't want to put it in the chat because otherwise everyone would put it. <laughs> <laughs>
but then Anna Maria will be there and uh, so we can yeah. Okay. I'm waiting for you Moving for there. the jury yeah. in the other in the special. <laughs> Congratulations, Manuel. Gracias. Thanks. El jurado por el momento el jurado. Listo. Y nosotros nos quedamos aquí. Sí. Muy bien. Bien, bien, hermano. bien hermano. Gracias por venir a todos. Muy bien, Ahora casi le ponés los pelos de punta a Fabio cuando dije Excelente. que importaba el ancho de la Z prima en el canal T. Todos nos equivocamos. ¿eh? <risa> no, 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 que lo que quisiste decir estaba bien, pero él lo entendió mal. Entonces él no lo dije mal. bien. No, 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 pero... sí, que es, eh, sí. sí, sí, pasa que es difícil la comunicación virtual sin un sí, pizarrón sí, de por medio. Ay, cuando estás presentando sí. te perdés, porque a veces sos el único que no está viendo qué es lo que está él queriendo decir, él estaba queriendo que digas, no, el ancho no importa en el canal T. Claro, sí, sí, entiendo. <risa> Pero no, está bien. Está bien no, pero estuvo muy bien, me gustó el, el ritmo, el hecho de hacer todo en, en media hora, presentar el trabajo y después poder discutir tranquilo, la verdad que fue una discusión muy, bueno, muy interesante, sí, sí, sí. de verdad me pareció mejor que muchos meetings en los que participé. Yo, la última pregunta de Fabio, eh, que estaba ahí, estaba, yo veo que Fabio ahí estaba tipo él, en su cabeza lo que nosotros estamos discutiendo siempre, de cómo hacer eh, que esto de que el Monte Carlo es tu prior y la data te lo ajusta a la realidad. Bueno, entonces mañana va a salir un paper resolviéndolo. Si lo tiene en la cabeza. <risa> Seguro. No, había, no habría no que haberlo dado. De información. No, no, estuve mal ahí. Hoy salió uno, ¿no? De como 100 páginas. Sí, de... EFT no, no lo leí pero son sus páginas tercer doctorado de Licas, ¿no? ¿Sí? ¿Sí? ¿no? ¿no? ¿cuarto? Tercero. ¿cuarto? Tercero. cuarto no, tercero sí. ¿yo, Mariel? ¿Yamila no, no, es, no fue Icas o fue? era Uba ¿no? Ah, uh, la uva. La uva. No, no, tuvimos anteriores, pero eran en la uva, es el tercero que, que pasa por San Martín. Sí. La tercera decía, este salió bien. <risa> eh, pongo el timbre. Tenía que pasar eventualmente. ¿Eh? ¿Pongo el timbre, Manu? ¿Están llegando los anguchitos? <risa> Me dijeron que no ibas a estar, Seki, perdón. Yo te, te iba a mandar y. <risa> ¿Qué hacemos? ¿Vamos a una plaza? ¿Tres de la tarde? No, yo tengo que dar clase, Daniel. Es, eh... Hoy no, pero... Estás dispensado bueno. totalmente, Manu. Eso dice, acá, eso dice acá, Rodrigo, pero me mandó un mensaje tremendo. Ah, pero esperen que voy a parar... Eh, acá me hago el buen Estoy borracho de la clase. Pues paramos de grabar ya, ¿no? Eh... Como pausa, ¿no? Acá nos mantenían al tanto por la cucaracha. Sí. Hay un espía. Hay que grabar de vuelta, sí. Nos queda de recuerdo. Bueno, genial, ¿eh? muy bueno. Quiero hacer el anuncio oficial. Bueno. Bueno, esto es para... Estamos todos, estamos todos de regreso. Are we all again in this Zoom session? I think so. Yes. I guess, I don't I think think that Fabio, no, because Fabio, Fabio has my, to... My mobile. Like so that... Eh, vamos, no, no vamos a leer el acta, porque ya la leímos dos veces. Simplemente vamos a anunciar que, obviamente, Manuel es el nuevo doctor de la Universidad de San Martín. Felicitaciones, vamos a decir que está también con mención de honor. Así que bueno, felicitaciones también a los, a los directores y uh, bueno, está. Nueva etapa. Muchas gracias por Grande, todo. Gracias. gracias a todos por gracias, venir, gracias Manu. por todo el esfuerzo. Gracias Ana María por toda la ayuda para que esto se pueda hacer en esta época. Eh. Bueno, thank you, Josie, and we expect you to come here as soon as the mm -hmm. pandemic ends. Gracias, Daniel. You have a barbecue <laughs> with your name here in at my house. Bueno, ahora 
we wait for we're waiting for the champagne and the <laughs> the, no, the, the, the cakes past the pastry and then um, but next time Samuel, so next year next year we come together we come together and, and we and and we celebrate and we celebrate together okay yes bye. So a, bye. thank you very much for everything thank you bye bye Manu, muchas felicidades. Muchas gracias por todo. Gracias por venir. Felicitaciones. Bien, amigo. Manu. Ok. Muchas gracias a todos. Felicitaciones nuevamente. Gracias, Martín. Gracias por todo. María, vos encargate. Que festeje. Que se emborrache. Nos conformamos con que no trabaje hoy. Ahí están Paco y Mile. Decí sí, los veo. Decir que yo sin ir no entendía español de Flo, porque si no, no pisás más Israel con tu chistecito del saquito. <risa> Pero no estaba, no estaba ahí. Ah, no estaba con eso. No, no. Mirá la viole. Cerrando las puertas del Weisman Institute. Claro. Cuando, cuando, cuando vaya a Israel lo mandan a la franja de Gaza de visita. Espera que te vamos a buscar. Un beso. Te escuchaba hablar y traía el juguetito, Viole. Ah, ¿en serio? Me muero. Qué linda. No, qué genial. Muchas gracias Grande, en serio no. por venir. Va a venir en, en el sentido de Zoom. Y ojalá podamos celebrar lo antes posible. Eh, al Seki le debo un vino, ya me lo dejó en claro. <risa> pará, 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 pará. A todos, no sé. <risa> es verdad, es verdad, es verdad. No, pero no, podríamos, eh, no sé, encontrarnos y brindar sí. para que... sí, en una plaza, Sí, con distancia, en una con plaza. Con distanciamiento. Voy a aparecer el verano. Sí, el fin de. O si no, en una escuela, en un aula. De la, de la capital, no hay ningún problema. Ahora se puede llegar. La corte te lo permite. Claro. Eh, bueno, paro esto.